17 days before the tragedy of September 11, 2001, a chilling event unfolded in a tiny New Hampshire town. A pilot weaponized an airplane, intentionally crashing it into his own home. The attack made national news. Who was this pilot? Why would he do such a thing? Now, the pilot's wife is speaking out. Joe Fonda, who was married to him for 20 years, says their relationship was characterized by emotional and financial abuse, infidelity, and instability from the very beginning. Less than 48 hours before the plane crash, Joe obtained a restraining order against him and fled with their eight-year-old daughter. Joe's terrifying story is a powerful reminder of what lurks when toxic relationships end. In fact, 90% of survivors experience post-separation abuse, which can escalate quickly and violently, even if the perpetrator has never been violent before. Ending a relationship doesn't end the danger. From Red Table Talk Podcast and iHeartMedia, I'm Dr. Romani, and this is Navigating Narcissism. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for medical or mental health advice. Individuals are advised to seek independent medical advice, counseling, and or therapy from a healthcare professional with respect to any medical condition, mental health issue, or health inquiry, including matters discussed on this podcast. This episode discusses abuse, which may be triggering to some people. The views and opinions expressed are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent the opinions of Red Table Talk Productions, iHeartMedia, or their employees. Joe, it is such a pleasure to have you here. Your story is actually one of the most profound and extreme examples of post-separation abuse I've heard. Let's talk about the man you ended up marrying. So you, how old were you when you met 16. Him? How did the two of you meet? I was out for a walk with a girlfriend of mine, and we were going by Union College, which is close to my, my home. And uh, we were just like, I've never been in a fraternity house. Have you ever been in a fraternity house? <laughs> and we like, let's go check it out. Mm. We just wandered mm -hmm. in thinking it was like going into a Starbucks or something. I don't know what we were thinking. But... We started going up the stairs and uh, just maybe a few steps up, this guy stops us and says, hey, excuse me, ladies, can I help you? And he was smiling and it was like, we're just looking around. And he's like, all right. <laughs> and he let us go. And then when we came back down the stairs, he introduced himself and it, it was my husband-to-be, Lou. We stayed for dinner and we chatted mm -hmm. and called my house the next day and asked me out on a date. Okay. So um, we went out to dinner. I made it very clear before when we were even talking that I had a boyfriend, Gino, and I wasn't looking to date anyone. He said, I have a girlfriend too. I'm like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. this is this is fine. Um, we can be friends. Okay. So how did, how did the relationship unfold from that point going forward? So it it kind of went off the rails pretty quickly, actually, even just as friends. So he had wanted me to go to like a fraternity mm -hmm. picnic um, maybe a couple weeks later. So at the time, Gino was still my boyfriend, although it was a long-distance relationship. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, no, Gino's coming to visit, ah. so I can't. Mm -hmm. And he was clearly not happy about it. So Gino came with a friend, and my friend and I went. To, to meet with them mm -hmm. and they I had to go home for something I came back where we were supposed to meet and he was gone mm -hmm. and I was like there were no cell phones back then there was right. there no, was no, absolutely no, no yeah, way no, to too. get in touch with someone back then mm -hmm. who you didn't know where they were yep. and I was distraught I was totally abandoned by Gino. I was irrationally looking all over town on foot mm -hmm. with my friend. And the only person I knew with a car was Lou. Ah, uh, okay. And Lou is the is the guy from the, the fraternity house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gave mm -hmm. me a ride home. Okay. 
But then the next day he called, he wanted to talk about what had happened. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, I had just called a friend for a ride. From his perspective, um, this woman that he was dating had blown him off on a date, gone on a date with someone else, and then called looking for um, free transportation. And instead of it being a conversation, he was driving fast and erratically. And like at first I was apologizing for what I did because I saw it when he said, all right, you did this thing to me and I saw it and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. You're right. That that was kind of a crappy thing for me to do. So the crappy thing you did was called him for a ride because you had been abandoned by Gino. Right. Was that why he was driving fast? Did that seem like a reaction to that because he was so oh, upset? Oh, yeah. He, he was mad about how I treated him. Mm-hmm. So he was embarrassed that I didn't go on this picnic, picnic with his friends. I was scared to death. He wouldn't let me out of the car. He, he did take me home, but I shut the door and, like, have a nice life. I thought I was never going to see him again. Okay. And you're 16. You're young. How old was Lou at this time? He's five years older than me. So 21. 16 to 21 is big. Yep. Developmentally, it's big in every which way. You, you, you were still a kid in many ways. He was coming into adulthood. So you have a lot going on. You've been abandoned by one guy who was having a tantrum. And then, and honestly, this other guy was having a tantrum. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> I got to say this, though, Joe, that that fast driving thing, that's, a, that's actually a red flag everyone can pay attention to. There's actually some interesting research on this, that these kinds of antagonistic, narcissistic personality styles are associated with dangerous driving. And that can show up early in a relationship because somebody's mad, or even that they're showing off, or they get mad by, about another driver. And I'll tell people, if you see someone driving real angry early in a relationship when it's easy to get out, get out. Because this is a marker for a bunch of other stuff. So you slam the door, get out of the car with Lou. You think you're never going to see him again. So then what happens? Then a little time goes by. I get a call. He needed to come back to Schenectady because things weren't going well with his parents and mm -hmm. they were kicking him out and he needed a place to live. And did I know a place that he could live? Mm -hmm. So I went and looked for him you know, and then tried to get back in touch saying, oh, I found this place, that place. I called the house a few times, left messages with his family, didn't hear anything back. And I was like, all right, whatever. And, uh, and then went about my way. By that time, I had broken up with Gino. Interesting, though, to me, throw the tantrum, drive the car in that but then he doesn't think anything much of calling you up because I, I think that's actually a, a, a big ask of someone. To ask them to help, especially a 16, 17-year-old, <laughs> right? To say, hey, help me find a place to live. It's a big, it's a big thing to ask. Right. And so you do. And he comes back in September. You've broken up with Gino. So what happens now? So what happens now is... I can't explain why. <laughs> I thought it would be um, a good idea to go visit at the fraternity house. I was totally emotionally a wreck. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't looking to have a new boyfriend, mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. least not consciously. Mm -hmm. And um, for whatever reason, thought that Lou and I could, could be friends. Okay. Okay. So I want to frame that a little, okay? Because you were 16 years old. This time I had turned 17. Okay. I just you turned were... a whopping okay. 17. <laughs> Not 30. <laughs> you're 16. You're 17. There's a guy who's older than you. You had a nice encounter. He, do, he uh, clearly throws tantrums when he doesn't get his way. You saw that. Drives erratically. Asks for a favor. You do it at 16, he doesn't communicate. Joe, the vast majority of adults wouldn't pick up those red flags. Okay, so you're, you're getting into it with him. This still doesn't sound like a relationship to me. No, it, it was um, after a few weeks of him being back at college um, and he knew I wasn't seeing Gino anymore, mm -hmm. um, he started to like press for like, well, so why aren't we going out now? Mm -hmm. You're not seeing him anymore. Okay. This is, I didn't have a good reason. Mm -hmm. 
And so it kissed for this first time and, okay. and started acting more like boyfriend, girlfriend. Okay. Let's fast forward a little bit. And it, you do get engaged to this person. <laughs> How did that happen? Following year, a girlfriend of mine wanted to go on a cruise. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, that would be fun. Agreed to go with her. And we, <laughs> and obviously Lou was not, now it's obvious that he would not be happy with me doing such a thing. Right. <laughs> he pitched quite a few fits about um, me going on this trip, but I, I didn't care mm -hmm. about his complaints. I was going. This was something I wanted to do. I had no intention of being long-term mm -hmm. in our relationship. So I went on the, the cruise, and while I was on the cruise, uh, I got paged, getting paged on a cruise It was like ship. the overhead, the like overhead. somebody said, you know, Joe, please come and mm -hmm. there's a phone call for you. Yeah, okay. Yep. yep. When I got the call through, it was, and it's weird, it sounds like a sonic thing. I don't know. I've never even heard it on a, on a movie, kind of what it sounds like, but it was like, will you marry me? <laughs> it was like a really bizarre sound on ship to shore calls oh, back geez. then. I was like, shit. Huh. That was like, oh, this is not, but you know, like he was barely speaking to me when I left. He was so mad. Because you were going on the cruise. Because I was going on the, mm -hmm. on the cruise. And, um, so my reaction was like, oh, you know, this was, it was dread. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, but what came out of my mouth was, yes. When you think back to that day, Joe, are you able to connect back into yourself in a way emotionally to think about where that yes came from? Even for that amount of time, he, I had the sense that he was dependent on me. Ah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. He was dependent on me for his well-being. Mm -hmm. So whether it was talking him down from being upset about something with, mm -hmm. so he was always upset about something with somebody. Ah. People, mm -hmm. people do what they do. And um, he would react very strongly to whatever people would do. Mm -hmm. And so there were all kinds mm -hmm. of offenses that I would run interference to to keep things from bothering him in the first place. I helped him with schoolwork. He wasn't doing well in school. Hmm. I would, if he was reading a, a book for a paper, I read the same book. Hmm. I took a lot of the same classes, basically. Even though I was going to school also, I was, I was helping him along. He hmm. was estranged from his family. He was hmm. all on his own. His, his, dad had stopped supporting his school financially when he hurt his knee and he had to um, stop playing football. Mm -hmm. So financially, I was also supporting. So I was working full time and going to school full time. I felt very needed. And it's not like in a good way. Like it's not like, oh, he needs me. Mm -hmm. No, no, I understand. The trauma bond can often begin through the belief that we need to help someone. For somebody as young as Joe, who subsequently did feel needed, with time, she then felt responsible for him, which would keep her stuck. She had a role and function in this relationship, and this sense of responsibility is often what underlies people getting stuck in unhealthy relationships. And so, they, since he needed you, it seems like that was a big driver in you saying yes, I guess the corollary to that would be, what did you think might have happened if you said no? Just like saying I'm going to go on this one-week cruise was a big deal. Right. Um, and there's so much anger and yeah, so yeah. many fights. Like, mm -hmm. and he would get physical, and he wasn't physical with me. He was mm -hmm. physical with stuff, you know, yeah, yeah, rip stuff, mm -hmm. bang on stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, um, he like the just visceral feeling from these these fights i knew that if i said no to getting married it wasn't going to be okay have a nice life i knew all hell would break loose okay so you're you're 17 okay 18. I just turned 18 18 that makes him 23 you're kind of taking full responsibility for another adult who sounds like a petulant tantruming child 
who is reacting strongly, who is always angry about things, who's huffing and puffing, who is financially reliant on you. I'm going to say it again, an 18-year-old girl. And I guess my question then is, there was some fear. Were you afraid? Well, I had seen what happened when he doesn't get, get his, his way. way. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not pretty anytime he was mad at somebody. He wasn't shy about showing his disappointment and his anger and right. placing blame. And and it, if he would have just said, you know, I'm just going to leave you behind, I would have been I would have been OK with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wasn't afraid of him uh, leaving me ever. Right, right. I was never afraid of right. him leaving me. You were afraid of his reactions. I was afraid of his anger. It's interesting. Early in the game, you already saw what that post-separation abuse was going to look like. If this guy doesn't get his way, the consequences are so dire that it's easier to appease him. And that's where I call sort of tantrums as manipulation. One of the things I, 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 I take fault with the field of even mental health of, well, a person has a choice when someone's having a tantrum, they can step away. But it's not that simple. Right. There's all the psychological dynamics in us of we like to feel needed. We want to feel helpful. We might feel obligated be around family roles, gender roles, whatever. And having these tantrums became a form of manipulation because over time you were living your life to keep the tantrums at bay. Especially the ones that seemed to be my fault. Correct. Which so over time, I'm sure everything became your fault. Oh, yeah. OK. So you get married. Once you got married, what was your relationship like? So he got accepted to Duke University oh, to well, their MBA program. That's a big deal. Helped him write his application. Right. So you basically, <laughs> you got accepted to Duke University for their MBA program <laughs> is what happened. You own that. So, yeah. <laughs> Help. Um, I worked. Um, I worked and he was going to, to school. Like I used to just, I would wake up in the morning and just have this help me like mm. like my first thought in the morning was like a, a a silent scream of help me you waited a while to have children you didn't have a child until 12 years into the marriage you get pregnant and can you tell me about the day that you found out you got pregnant yeah so we had been we had been trying um for a few months and then i did pee on the stick and it and it was positive mm -hmm. and I was like so excited and um, Lou was getting ready to go on a trip. He was a consultant at that mm -hmm. point and so he was traveling a lot. Um, and by this point, I knew he was cheating a lot. He came in the the bedroom and I I came out with the the thing and I said, "Look," and he's like, "Oh, okay." Oh, he just oh, and I said. Oh, you showed him a positive pregnancy test after you'd been trying for months. And his reaction was, oh, oh. And I said, oh, mm -hmm. and okay. he goes, all right, well, I don't know what you congratulations. What do you expect me to say? And and then he like gave me a, a, a little peck and said, I, I got to go. And he went on his trip. I think the part I I haven't really explained is he was also very charming. Um, okay. So I haven't I haven't really explained the the forward facing persona when anybody would meet him on a on a professional basis. He's the big smile, glad hand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He was an expert in his field, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, normal people when he, they would meet he was laughing and joking around mm -hmm. about things so he wasn't just this this grumpy jerk um until somebody irritated him okay so he would be charming and charismatic people were drawn to him i maybe did that play a role even back when you were at you you know he was at union and he was a student he had it back then so when he met my parents they were impressed okay all right so he had this charm and charisma and only when he would be frustrated or disappointed would this kind of crack show up and then he would be quick to react yeah so you know dr jekyll mr hyde mr hyde would come out when someone didn't go his right. way 
<laughs> Did other people see that? People saw one or the other for the most part. So there are plenty of people who never saw that side of Lou that okay. was angry. Like a lot of times he would bring it home and then other times he would flip out in a store. Oh, okay. Okay. All so right. So you he would see occasionally mm-hmm. flip out mm-hmm. in a in a public setting, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I would be like, hey, you know, dial it back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Okay. We still need to get our food here, kind of thing. Do you feel like mostly he brought it home? Mostly he brought it home, or okay. he was covert about how he would get his revenge on someone. In these twelve years, what I'm hearing is there were some good times. Mister Charm would show up, and you would. Have fun. Was every morning waking up with dread for 12 years before you found out you were pregnant? Oh, gosh, no. No. Okay. No, no we so, did We did lots of things. We, we would go hiking, and okay. within a certain week, there would be good and okay. bad times. But... So there were good times. There were also these tantrums. You get this lukewarm reaction from him. And you're pregnant now. Tell me about the day then your daughter was actually born. He was miserable throughout my pregnancy. Why? He projected a, a horrible life to Be- follow. I was going to get fat. Oh. Um, I was going to get ugly. Um, mm-hmm. We were going to have, he called it a life of crumminess ahead. Okay. Was he not in on the wanting to get pregnant in the first place? Or was that just, was that was that something you wanted and he agreed to? Was he ever enthusiastic about it? There I'm a little bit confused because it seemed like he was into it. He was into it um, before we actually got pregnant. Um, okay. Get, even during the process of getting pregnant, he was 100% into it. Right. But that was a light switch moment um, when I showed him the stick. And Interesting. Okay. And then after that, he just got increasingly down about the whole thing. So it was more of that withdrawal again. I mean, it it almost feels like that that pattern got reproduced again there as well. I was sure he was going to leave me. Oh, okay. All right. I was okay with that. And you're okay with that. (laughs) Despite we had fun hiking and there was this charming guy, by and large, the dread woman from the early years of the marriage, that never left. So the entire marriage, it was sort of, I kind of wish this guy would just go away, but I'm not going to end it. Yeah. Okay. So you have... A baby. Did you stay in the same house that you were in or did you? Okay, so you didn't. Did you ever have to do anything like that? Like look for a house together? So that whole process was a a complete disaster. Every house that we looked at was unacceptable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And from silly little things like, oh, that has a dead tree in front. If they would leave a dead tree in front, what kind of things are they hiding inside the house? You couldn't have neighbors being too close to you. You couldn't have, the, it can be the best house in the neighborhood. It couldn't be the worst house in the neighborhood. You can't have neighbors too close. And I picked a spot in the middle of an 11 acre lot. And that's where we determined that we could build. So we were living in temporary, like a, um, a condo. And how did all of that go? Awful. Um, the, the builder at one point sent a, a an email saying that he was no longer willing to talk to Lou oh. or communicate with Lou or see Lou. Mm. He was micromanaging everything on the property and then he would blow up, explode to the point where like, at one point his he damaged his vocal cords by yelling so much and thought he broke bones in his in his hand from like pounding his fist while he was yelling at the guy. Okay, so so he all, all, you're back to traditional reactive tantruming Lou. How are you feeling emotionally? I was furious with you angry. Mm-hmm. I was angry. I knew he was cheating in all all, all kinds of every every port in the storm. He was he had a something going on mm-hmm. um, wherever he was going. So he was still um, traveling for work. He was, and so he was constantly on the hunt for people locally and people like if he had a, a client out in Pennsylvania, he'd be hunting there. If he had a client and uh, he had one in Oregon, he had one in um, California, he was hunting all the time. And, you know, so even though he was telling me, you know, no, I'm not doing anything, but if you keep 
pestering me and nagging me about this, it will happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're going to make this a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, at this point, he was had taken up bodybuilding as a as a hobby, mm-hmm. and and <laughs> he found a new girlfriend. Okay, but he wasn't hiding it from me anymore. Okay, so it went from um, undercover relationships that I knew about, but for whatever reason, you probably know, <laughs> I don't, but didn't call him out on him, um, to in my face relationship. What does it mean in his, in your face? Like, like I knew and he knew talked knew. and he knew I knew, and he actually would make me clear out from our our townhouse sometimes for she had a open relationship with her husband so it was kind of sanctioned on her side at first but then when they got too chummy then her husband was was calling it out okay so i need to understand this you're renting a townhouse you're building a house you have a daughter you're married Mm -hmm. you didn't call him out on past infidelity so there's no conversation there there was never like an explosive i know you're cheating nothing he would cheat you you knew it and you looked the other way. For the most part. Yeah, I would call out the beha- the hunting behavior and he would deny the hunting for somebody. Okay. And then say, if I kept it up, I was going to cause the relationship. Okay, and got it. would I be got, my fault. I understand that. But so now, I didn't even bother saying. Okay. So now he's got this new one. Mm-hmm. You're all living in a townhouse. He's asking you to leave the townhouse so he can have his girlfriend over to have sex with her. Because she made him happy. Because she made him happy. Okay. So now there's no not seeing it. Like here I am. This is, to me, the read I would have on this as anyone listening to this is he is trying to make you leave the marriage. Yeah. And it gets worse. Okay. He was like, oh, you know, her husband is a bad guy because, you know, he said no. She's like, this is abusive. She should actually move in with us and we should you know, pay for her to go to college. Okay, holy sister wives. Like, what is happening? So he is saying, I I need to take (laughs) this in, okay? I do too. (laughs) Up till now, I got to say, I'm like, okay, this just sounds like an unhappy relationship until let's run the girlfriend mentorship program in our house and move this woman in, pay her tuition, (laughs) You're not in an open relationship. No. How well, are you not responding? voluntarily? <laughs> How are you responding to this? So I'm I'm pushing back, saying no, we can't be doing this. And then he would get mad, and um, and he would blow up, and then I would get um, beat down um, verbally, emotionally you know, about how horrible his life is. And this is the only thing that makes him happy. And, you know, because we're living in a townhouse. How horrible. I almost feel like a student in a classroom. Like, (laughs) question. (laughs) Okay. In any story like this, okay, a person who is so enamored of their side person would move out. They'd say, I've met someone. I love them or I fall in love or whatever. And I'm going to go rent my own place. Bye. Will my lawyer will be in touch with you about the details? I've heard that story before. And it's a devastating, heartbreaking story. The idea that someone's leaving you for someone else is the ultimate in abandonment. I understand that story. He's asking you to adjust to this. Correct. And he didn't want to leave. And I don't think she wanted him... I think she could see what an un, unpleasant person he could be. So she was getting all the good stuff, but I think she could also see how he was acting towards me. So it's not like she was wanting to leave her husband. Lou asked her to leave, leave her, her husband. husband. To move and full-time then, into your townhouse with you and your daughter. The new present. house. Ultimately gonna, the new house. Yeah. Um, and then he asked me to talk to her and encourage her to do so. I, 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 I'm just, okay. So here's the thing. Can't pick it up. You can't make it. I mean, my head is spinning with the, the utter lack of empathy. 
you know, I've I've heard variants on this. The 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 father having an inappropriate relationship with like a live-in nanny or an au pair, right? But this is a person he gets into a relationship with, but is it seems like there's almost zero self-awareness that this is a completely inappropriate thing to ask for. That do you understand what I'm saying? Like, the, oh, he he thought he was better than most husbands that go out drinking and go to bars and hang out with their friends and go play, you know, go to sports games. He thinks this is so. Having a girlfriend that you move into the house is on the same level as having a beer with somebody and watching a Patriots game. Better than yeah, but. <laughs> it, it, it's not planet Earth, at least not the United States planet Earth. And if I cared about him, I would want him to be happy. Okay, so this is manipulation on such a high level. I, I've got to tell you, you, you might have broken a new sort of world speed record on navigating narcissism, and that takes some doing. Because we've heard stuff here, but the idea that you are in a, mon a presumptively monogamous marriage with someone who is asking you to do this, how were you feeling at this point? So this is when I started um, having spells of lightheadedness and um, my heart was racing and mm -hmm. I would feel dizzy and I would have to like suddenly sit down. I thought I was having a heart attack mm. a few times. I went to the doctor thinking, all right, there's something wrong with my heart. And... Um, Lou knew that I was having these physical reactions. The physical test came back negative for any issues. Then they, they asked, all right, well, what's going on in your private life? Mm -hmm. And I talked about the stress of moving, trying to find a house and move and build a house and that we'd been fighting because of the stress of the move. And then they said, you have anxiety-induced depression. It sounds like you're having panic attacks. I mean, those um, lightheaded, d dizzy, and, and that, heart attack moments were panic attacks. Correct. And that those episodes were panic attacks. So they basically said you have depression, anxiety, and you're experiencing panic attacks. Okay. When you're, and then they started medication. Did you mention to the, the medical team you're working with, and by the way, my husband is having an affair and wants to move his affair partner into the house while we remain married. Did you share that tidbit with them? No. <laughs> okay, because that's a big one, right? And it's interesting you didn't. It really, really is. What do you think drove that decision to not share that piece of it? It's embarrassing even to talk about now because I, objectively I would say that anybody would just say, screw this and leave. See, I, I want to put your feet to the fire on that, Joe, because this isn't about you. This is about that somebody thought this was okay to do this to you. You're absolutely right. A lot of people said would say, come on now, get up, find your, you know, get out of there. What's wrong with you? You know, uh, absolutely not. I think I am having this shocked reaction because what this person did was shocking and remorseless and unempathic. And when we are in the wake of that kind of behavior, we have panic attacks. It's almost as though a short circuiting in the system starts to take place. We're, we're experiencing this cataclysmic fear, but we can't give word to it. And so I hear, I totally, I fully, fully empathize with the sense of embarrassment that one would feel about sharing this. But I really want to put a fine point on this. You weren't doing anything. You were living a life. And there's nothing foolish about what you did. You had a family. You had a child. And we had a guest on this podcast named Dr. Jennifer Fried. She talks about betrayal blindness, that when we are betrayed, there is a not seeing it that can happen and not acknowledging it. And she even uses this interesting term of it whooshes away. Just you see this guy. There's no not seeing this. He's I'm going to move this person in. And while there was certainly this moment of in the doctor's office not wanting to share with them the wholeness of what was happening, there was a placing it aside. So how did you talk about this in your marriage? So we would go through these these cycles where I would say, all right, you, you can't keep doing this. This has to stop. I need to have some self-respect and mm -hmm. you need to show me respect. I understand this is what makes you happy, but it's not fair to me. Imagine being me. And then he would just 
blow up and beat me down and then claim that I had set him up for this, that somehow I was responsible for him being in this position of having this um, relationship that he now cannot live without. Mm -hmm. And then he would claim that I had said everything was okay and that I was fine with it. And I was like, I never, I That's never. That's gaslighting. Never, ever, never, ever did I ever. Mm -hmm. So yes, I a couple times I, I, I went along with it because you beat me down. And what did going along with it look like? Like me leaving the apartment. Oh, um, I see. And so somebody's gaslighting you. Someone's manipulating you. You're upside down. So you'll sometimes almost seem like it's agreement, mm -hmm. right? Like you're you're in it. That's that's actually that's the end. That's the end of the gaslighting cycle. Very few people get all the way down into the 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 sort of the bottom floor of the whole gaslighting process. Like I remember just like uh, literally being on the floor during these arguments and and him you know beating on a chair. Yeah you know, and in, insisting that this was my fault and that my emotional problem goes way back and it has nothing to do with him or um, her. Right. And that it's, you know, this is all about, you know, like when I got pregnant that, you know, my issues date way back then and it's got nothing to do with now. And like, yeah, right, I, I agree that I've had emotional issues for a long time, but this has taken it to a whole new level. He's making it about your emotional issues at this mm -hmm. point. Your emotional issues, emotional issues, tracking them back to the pregnancy. You're even sitting here saying, I acknowledge I have emotional issues. You do realize that the vast majority of these emotional issues sound like they were caused by being married to a man like this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm not, you know what I'm saying? I it, get it now. You weren't presenting with a history of anxiety and depression by your reports, even growing up. He's telling you you're the one with the problem. Mm -hmm. So how, where do you go with that? So I wrote a long letter because like, I like whatever I say, he said it, I didn't say it. So if I right, send an yeah. email, yeah. Mm -hmm. then I'll have mm -hmm. it in writing and I can, I could like pull out my documentation and prove, no, this is what I said. See, it says it right here. Yeah. Um, so I wrote this really long letter saying, you know, exactly how I felt about everything. And I acknowledged, you know, my part to the extent that I have a part. Um, but I, I let it happen. I acknowledged my part and, and said, this isn't healthy for me. It's not good for me. I can't do this. If you want to pursue this, I will be a good co-parent, basically, mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, great. I wish you all the best. I want you to be happy. I want me to be happy too, though. So I cannot live this way. Okay. And um, so don't be thinking that I approve in any sense. I never have. Right. You know, there are times when I said, do what you want, but I didn't say I'm okay with it. It was a very loving Mm -hmm. Letter. Writing long letters in order to feel heard is a telltale sign you're being gaslighted and maybe dealing with a narcissist. Remember, narcissists are all about power, control, and domination. Arguing, just to get your point across, can be destabilizing and unsettling as they use tactics like gaslighting and fast-paced pressured speech to overwhelm and dominate the conversation. They always try to win the argument. If you find yourself writing long letters or text messages to explain yourself, it may be a sign that you are in a toxic relationship. His response was, First, he didn't even acknowledge that he got it. And then he said, oh, yeah, um, yeah, I got that. We decided that there's too much pressure on us, so we're not going to see each other anymore. I'm like, this means you're going to go underground, basically. So he's going to go seek out new supply. I mean, because that's what these other women are. They're, they're sources of narcissistic supply or, you know, that that's really what it sounds like. So this is the too much pressure is basically your letter saying if you want to pursue this, pursue this, but I'm out. Mm -hmm. And him saying then, well, that's too much pressure that in essence, he can't have both things. He can't just basically openly have this relationship in this townhouse in your presence meant that he actually had to make a choice. So he said, okay, 
I'm going to end that relationship with her. How did that feel? I was so proud of my letter. And I I really thought, okay, this is, he's going to like have his aha, you know, like, oh, mm. I, I get it now. I see what I, yeah. No, it was, it was, um, I was like, oh, yeah, now what? You know. So now what? Yeah, now what? And so now he pretended that they they weren't seeing each other anymore. And, but they were. But they were. At one point, he gave her an ultimatum, basically, to because he wasn't happy with sharing her anymore with her husband. So he gave her an ultimatum, and she's like, "Yeah, I'm just gonna focus on my marriage now." And she ended it with him. Okay, so she ended it. When we're talking about mechanics, we're talking about you know the absurdity of it all. Were you hurt? I was hoping that they would they would decide to be together. I was. I wasn't hurt. I was thinking this was my potential out. So you really were looking for the out. But it seemed that him ending that relationship meant you didn't have your out. Correct. Even though you always had your out. I didn't see an out. You didn't see an out. Because you were afraid of what? The same reason I said yes to getting married in the first place. Um, The vague, I'm going to deal with your wrath. Okay, so you were still afraid of his wrath. You were afraid of his anger. And so if he was with the new gal, in theory, well, he's got a safe place to land. He's got his person. He's all sorted. So then you could get up and leave. And it would be less of a, there'd be less of this reaction. Did this house ever get built? Yeah. So the, the house got built. She stopped seeing him, but he went right back to hunting. Sure. For relationships. And I saw that and I'm like, All right, I don't, I didn't even unpack my stuff. Um, so we moved into the house and I unpacked just about everything, but, but my stuff was still in boxes. I started, um, to talk to people more. So Mm -hmm. I talked to one of my sisters. I shared with her, you know, some of the, the relationship issues with, with him and how he was behaving with the house hunting and the build and the other women. And she was supportive and it was like amazing to me after all these years of not talking to anybody that there was support. Right. So now suddenly people are starting to give me advice, but also saying, well, that's not cool. The way he treats me (coughs) is, is not okay. It's not normal. People don't do that. Um, And it's bizarre that you need somebody to tell you it's not your fault. And you know, they're not acting that way because of what you did. They're acting that way because of who they are. So now you've got support. You're talking to people, but you're still living in the same house as this guy. Okay. Your stuff isn't fully unpacked. There's a part of you that seems psychologically resistant. At this point, the wheels are off, right? The, your your um, husband is basically having a series of multiple relationships with other people. Another piece of this story is also that Lou was a private pilot. We owned a private airplane. I know that there was a part of your story that I'd like to have you share is that you and your daughter and he were on an airplane and something became very clear to you at that point. Could you share some of that? Yeah. So I said, all right, I want a divorce. Mm -hmm. We are going to divorce. And he wasn't having it. He admitted to a sexual addiction (sighs) and he would only go to counseling of any sort if I agreed to stay together. But the counseling he wanted to sign up for was sexual addiction counseling. Just as an aside, sex addiction is it's it, there's a phenomenology there. There's no two ways about it. Okay. It is we see it come out in multiple different ways: um, pornography, uh, hiring people to have sex with somebody. Um, going on, like nowadays, there's a million different ways you could find a person to have, you know, sex anywhere with you. Um, it's dysregulated. It, 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 the addiction term is meant that the person feels that they almost can't control the urge. While there is some talk of love addiction, it really is, sex addiction is it's not relational, right? It is about sex, masturbation, pornography, short-term sexual hits, whatever. It's not about somebody showing up and saying, I want to move my girlfriend into our home. (laughs) 
That's not sex addiction. And I, and I think that the, the commandeering of the sex addiction defense, people who study it, they'll see that they're actually, they're, there's, a whole, there's a whole picture there. There's often a lot of remorse. There's often a lot of shame. And in therapy, there's often a lot of work on trauma. And all, it's just very complicated, right? Mm -hmm. And so at, at that point, I had moved out of our bedroom. And he was just getting increasingly weird and weirder and weirder and weirder. And um, and then he had made appointments for um, dental work for all three of us back in Delaware. So we haul ourselves back to Delaware, and while we were on the the plane, I'm in the in the co-pilot seat, and Angelica's in the back, and he's flying. And all of a sudden, I had an overwhelming s clarity that he intended to crash the plane with all three of us in it on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just sitting there and I'm like, because, you know, he had been getting weirder and weirder the more it became clear I was determined to leave mm -hmm. um, and had made threats, mm -hmm. vague threats, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and but nothing, nothing specific. And I was like, oh, my God, he he's going to kill all of us. Mm -hmm. And I sat there and I'm like, all right, all right if he's going to put the, the plane in a dive, all right, all right, there's a knife here. I'm going to grab this knife here. I'm going to I'm going to blind him. And then I can once he's blinded, I could I could kill him because you know, he can't fight back from that. And I know how to how to operate the plane myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm not a pilot, but mm -hmm. I can do it and I can dial for help and dial in for help and figured all that out and none of that happened clearly none right, of that happened right. okay <laughs> um but when we got back that night safely i was determined that there was there was serious serious danger got sense that it's not safe it's not okay to leave it's not safe to leave so we got back home i finally got my my stuff together mm -hmm. to decide to to leave and came up with a plan I called um, my sister had given me the phone number for the um, domestic violence um, support and called it and um, explained not everything clearly but enough and got the feedback that um, you're not crazy um, and if you don't feel safe, you're probably not, you know, you should, you should leave with a safety plan. Yeah. So I decided that I was going to pack up a few things in the back of the car and uh, go see a lawyer, which I was forbidden from doing, but I did it anyway. But in that one day, I found a lawyer to see me, mm -hmm. um, agree to help me. I gave him a, a retainer and, um, and then I my intention was to go pick up Angelica from camp and then just take off with her before he even got home. Okay. But I don't know if he had a sense that something was unusual. And for the first time ever, he went and picked her up mm -hmm. um, from camp. So I'm like, oh, now I gotta, <laughs> I gotta figure something mm -hmm. else. And uh, and then we needed to take a car to service. Mm -hmm. And so Lou and I met up. I got Angelica in the back seat with me, my car, which was a, a, a bit of a trick because Lou's like, he wants to drive that car. And I was like, oh, I felt like an actress. I'm like, oh, you drive it on the way back. You know, I'll follow you over there. You drive, we'll drop the car off and then I'll follow you back. And then when we were getting off an exit to where the car dealership was, I slowed down and then I kind of darted back down mm -hmm. and on the highway and and just gunned it. Mm -hmm. And then he noticed I wasn't behind him after he made the turn. And then he, he called me on the cell phone and was like, oh, did you miss the turn? Or, you know, I'm like, yeah, um, I'm going to, I need a break. This has just been too much. And I'm going to, I saw a lawyer 
filing for divorce. I suggest you go see a lawyer too. I let him talk to Angelica. I explained to Angelica on the, the drive before I took off what was going to happen mm-hmm. and just said, you know, clearly we've been fighting. He called. I just kept saying, I just need peace, mm-hmm. please. I just need peace. And um, went to one hotel. So now you and Angelica are staying in hotels. We stayed at a hotel that night. One night. Then? And then the next day went to the back to the lawyer's office as planned. The attorney um, said this is clearly um, emotional abuse. Um, good for him. Domestic or abuse. Good for her. And he, yeah, mm-hmm. he was someone who had been trained. So then I go to the courthouse. Right. We had written up an affidavit and I wrote up the a petition for a restraining order. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to get a restraining order. The attorney is the the one who told me you really mm-hmm. need it because this is the only thing that you can use to stop him from constantly calling you okay. and harassing you okay. and this is how you can have temporary custody of your daughter. Okay. So you take the paperwork for the temporary restraining order to the courthouse yep. and meeting with the judge, he hears it all and he said, I'll grant this. This is a one month temporary restraining order. And so you got it. Mm-hmm. So now how does how did that work? That they, they would they would still serve him to let him know that it's in Yeah, so around ten thirty at night I got a call from the the police saying they were getting ready to serve. To serve, okay. And they wanted to know details about the house and got guns it. and um mm-hmm. and stuff. And um, I explained all that and he's not somebody that you want to disregard. If he takes like a you're not gonna take me out of here um stance, he means it. Okay. You know, and, and they're like, oh, you know, we deal with this stuff okay. all the time. And Does then, that go off without incident? So they call me back and say, you know, he put up a resistance at first, but he gave in, went in and got his computer and some stuff and um, said he was going to go to a hotel. Okay, so he's gone to his own hotel. Yep. He just still doesn't know where you are. Right. Okay, now it's the next day. Now what happens? 7.20 in the morning, I get a phone call uh, on my cell phone and I see it's Lou. And okay. I'm like, yeah, it didn't surprise me because sure. I really didn't expect him to abide by the order. Right. I don't want him to get in trouble. And I also don't want him to have an opportunity to leave me a, a nasty voicemail because he had been leaving me like really nasty stuff. Okay, so you, 7.20 in the morning, he violates the order. He calls you. You don't report it to the police. Then what happens? About maybe a half hour later, I get a call about our alarm system. And they said the panic alarm in your master bedroom has gone off. You're getting a phone call about that? From the security company. From the security company, got it. I'm like, oh, I said, nobody should be there. Um, Please notify the police. Nobody should be there. And if that's happening, then there's there's a a real problem. So So then then I'm pacing around and then call the police. And I said, you know, I've been waiting for a call back. And they're like, oh, my God, thank you for calling. An airplane crashed into your house, and it's it's fully engulfed in flames. And we need you to go to the property um, now to help um, the responders. I got there, and the the entire development was just all emergency vehicles, police, mm-hmm. ambulance, fire trucks mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. from multiple towns, mm-hmm. and the yep. media was already there. Because a plane crashed into a house, like that's a, a plane, thing. The neighbors called it in, and right? And that's what made the panic alarm go off. The plane crash made the plane crash made it go off. Okay, so you get to your house. There is a plane crashed into your house. Obviously, the police had the records of me going to the police department, them serving the the um, restraining order, so they knew that that was an incident house. I see. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm, their biggest mm-hmm, concern mm-hmm, was mm-hmm. that. We were in the house mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. more than anything yeah. else. So for for them, it was kind of like, all right, this is not as bad as it could have been. Um, because you and your because, daughter weren't in the house. Because we weren't not in the house. Okay. So what went through your head when you got to the house? I was scared that he somehow had managed to do this and make it look like maybe he was dead too but that he wasn't oh so so you you suspected it was him as soon as you heard plane crash in the house you suspected it was him okay because which would be reasonable because planes don't 
crash into houses. Yeah, I wasn't thinking it was a coincidence. No, um, no, 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 no. I mean, a plane could crash and right. just land in the street or in a neighborhood or in a yard and harm a house, but this went right into the house. Yeah, and this was in the middle of a, it was a, a clearing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Out yeah, of an 11-acre. Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It was a very precise precision attack. So it isn't, but that that jumps out at me that what went through your head was that I know it's him and my concern is that he is still alive. Somehow. I had to lay out the the schematics of the house, yeah, so to yeah. speak, for them and then explained about Lou's stature and, you know, identifying features and um, and stuff so that when they when they did Mm-hmm. get to the plane because they hadn't gotten to the plane itself yet. It was all based on the neighbors saying what they saw um, with the airplane circling um, before the, the crash. Okay. So when they said, yeah, we did find a body and it matches mm-hmm. your description mm-hmm. or the remains match mm-hmm. your description mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. clearly there was a fire. The house mm-hmm. was the house was just a skeleton. Mm-hmm. So now you know he's dead. There's a body. There's remains. You can't, you know, I mean, and it was clearly him. Okay. It had to have been an extraordinarily difficult time. You've lost your home. You've gone through the terror of leaving this relationship. You knew it was going to be bad. It certainly doesn't sound like you ever thought it was going to be this. And the hardest part was telling Angelica what had happened. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so that was, that was horrible. And then later that night, having to call his mother and his sister and you know, call my family, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, but calling his mother was really tough. Um, But then after that, it was really media. Um, Mm -hmm. Media was relentless. It was very interesting to the world. Yeah. That was August 25th. Of 2001. 2001. And then in the morning of September 11th. 2001. um, My my friend, one of the ones who had been a, a real support person um, and my closest friend, um, he called. He said, are you watching TV? I said, oh, what, what channel? I wasn't. He goes, any. And I turned on the TV and, and y- you know, the images that were going. So now I had, oh, my God, like. Is this this my fault? Because it had been mm. national, it, not just national news. It was mm. international news. It was everywhere, you know, about um, what he had done and kamikaze pilot and burns down his yeah. house and crashes into the house. And I felt responsible. Um, and even though I know <laughs> it's not like I go through like, okay, they were probably just going to hijack those planes. You know, like, but they got this idea from Lou Mm -hmm. to, like, do this instead with crashing into buildings and, like, oh, my God, this is all my fault. Everyone's going to know this is my fault. So, so, yeah, a little PTSD from (laughs) from that alone. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I think (laughs) on top of probably other things for years. It's it is it the trauma survivors blame themselves for things that have nothing to do with them. It's what it's part of the architecture of trauma, a, a throwback to trying to attempt to make some sense of control over something that was happening, and the proximity of something that was such a catastrophic event in your life against an image that was so similar two weeks later is, I mean, you were, you were in the throes of acute trauma at that point. When, when 9-11 happened, you, it, was, it was what? It was um, like 17, 17 days. days yeah. you know, so that's, we consider that acute traumatic stress. Most people will continue to have trauma responses within that 30-day period. Most people will then, uh, you know, sort of, it will, there will be a tailing off and, It'll still it'll leave a toll, but may not cause impairment in their life. But that but that that connection of those two events took what was already your daughter's grief. It was her father, and this is not the end you wanted. You wanted the two of you to be able to go off into your own separate lives. Mm-hmm. This is not what you 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 had hoped for. And then you also still lived in fear right until the very last moment 
that he was still alive and could harm you. He, this was a person who felt dangerous to you. But I, I want to now focus in the years later, because your daughter Angelica is now an adult, right? She's grown up and she will go into relationships now. What? What did you t what did you talk to her about when she started dating? Honestly, she's she's been married now for oh, 7 years. Wow. Um she's married to her first and only boyfriend. Oh, wow. Okay. That she um started dating in high school, but before she dated him, you know, I did talk to her and yeah. one of her girlfriends and her girlfriend was um maybe a little more interested in boys mm, than mm, Angelica was mm -hmm. at the time. And I talked to them about my experience. And mm, Good. Um, good. I did not, you know, and I talked about the earlier times with, mm -hmm. um, even before Lou, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and mistakes I made and, you know, not things are dangerous. It's more about the self-respect and yeah. Yeah. you know don't settle for things that aren't right if something doesn't feel right it's not right like it, it yeah just basically if you don't feel good if mm -hmm. in a a relationship it's mm -hmm. probably not good for you <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's tough that's tough advice for young people to to listen to so how have you been healing how what's your healing process been like i'm married to a good guy oh good you know, congratulations he's a good guy and he's been through his share of bad okay. bad experiences okay. himself um so in general we're really good to each other good but you trusted love enough to get married again which is amazing i never thought i would yeah i, yeah, I keep a very tight circle mm -hmm. So um, I'm, ex I feel really vulnerable outside of yeah, the circle. Yeah, yeah, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But when I, I'm great with my circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I actually, and, have and a, you know I what? I think circles. I think the small yeah. circle idea is actually very much the landscape of survivorship. I, I always say your relationship with trust is going to change. Right now, I want to ask you one last question, which is, if you could talk to your 16-year-old self who had just met Lou in the stairwell of a frat house, what would you tell her? Well, I'm going to preface this by, you know, I'm like, to change anything is to change everything, and then mm -hmm. I don't That's have right. Angelica. That's good for um, you. For, 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 I'm glad <laughs> so you said that. So I, would, I wouldn't change a mm -hmm. thing that resulted in not, yeah. not having her in my life. But the... My instincts were right when I got out of the car yeah. um, after the speeding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, everything was fine up till then. Yep. You know, there's, yep. you know, even mm -hmm. though there was, there mm -hmm. was a couple awkward things, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with the early dates, but, or not date, whatever those were. But my instinct when I got out of that car and slammed it and said, that's it, were right. There was no reason to go back and test the waters again. Yeah. Yeah, y yes, and yet most people do. But I really want to come back to what you said. To change anything would be to change everything. It was such, a, I've never heard anyone quite say it that way, Joe, and I'm really glad we're sort of ending in that place because many survivors will spend years ruminating. If I'd done this, if I'd done this, if I'd done this, I'd have done this. And the clarity of your focus on Angelica this is the daughter I wanted. This is the human being I wanted in the world. And a whole series of events had to happen. And that put Angelica in the world. And that framing of the suffering as something larger is that, you know, they, that whatever, you know, whatever sort of universal calculus is being done mm -hmm. at that moment happened. And no, I didn't get out of the car. And by not getting out of the car, this happened. I, this, this, this human being came into my life. It's a hard way sometimes to view it because so much suffering happened, but it can sometimes be the way to view it that allows us to find the psychological strength, the soul strength mm -hmm. to keep fighting another day. So I have to say that perspective taking is quite remarkable mm -hmm. given what you had went through. So thank you so much oh. for sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Here are my takeaways from my conversation with Joe. Let's start with one of the last things Joe said. 
Jo ended her story with a profound quote that I do hope at some point in their healing that survivors are able to feel. She said, to change anything is to change everything. I thought that was a beautiful framing. Now, I have no doubt that some survivors may not resonate with that, but for many of you, there was something that grew out of these toxic relationships. Beloved children, some good family relationships, self-awareness, and even experiences. I view it as those flowers that sometimes grow out of the sidewalk cracks. From the harshest of places, beautiful things can grow. We don't get do-overs, and all we can do is take a moment and recognize that there may be some things in our life that came from this struggle. Framing these experiences in a meaning-oriented way doesn't take away the pain, but it may foster your healing. In our next takeaway, when I hear a story like Joe's, I wish there was a high school class on warning signs and dangerous patterns in new relationships. The reactive sensitivity, fast driving, jealousy, these often are signs that show up early and are always a sign of problems to come. Charm and charisma can make it hard to spy these patterns. In Joe's relationship, she said she quickly slid into a pattern of rescuing, with Joe looking for places for him to live. And this rescuing can often happen if someone believes that this may soothe the narcissistic person. These patterns can start getting set early in narcissistic relationships, and somehow we have to find a way to shine a light on these patterns so there is less risk of young people making excuses for potentially abusive partners. For this next takeaway, this story teaches us how narcissistic tantrums and the drive to make them stop by appeasing the narcissistic person means that almost everything that happens in a relationship like this is coercive. Being paged multiple times on a cruise ship And then having to say yes to a marriage proposal so she could make his harassment stop is not consent. But yet over and over in these relationships, people relent to all kinds of things to make the abusive, harassing behavior stop for a moment. Then when that gets coupled with a sense of guilt or pity for the narcissistic person, A person, especially a young person, can get corralled into a situation that is very difficult to safely climb out of. In our next takeaway, there's entitlement and then there's entitlement. Her husband's request that she allow his girlfriend to move into their home together simply because she made him happy, that's a whole other level of entitlement. We always think we have gotten to the far boundary of entitlement, but then we hear something like this. It's easy to take a hard line stance and believe we would never put up with something like this. However, after years of enduring emotional abuse in the relationship, a person in a relationship like this may not fully register it. However, Joe's body did register it, and the cardiac symptoms she was having turned out to be panic attacks, which are not unusual in people experiencing this toxic and abusive a relationship. In our last takeaway, Joe's pattern of self-blame after the plane crash went so deep that she blamed herself for the 9-11 attacks, which occurred just 17 days later. She was still in the throes of an acute stress crisis, and trauma survivors often do blame themselves for events that are clearly unrelated to them. But the similarity of the events, her accumulated history of trauma within the relationship, and the recent trauma of experiencing a similar event connects all of this. While most stories of post-separation abuse do not have such extreme outcomes, It is not unusual for survivors of these kinds of abusive relationships and post-separation abuse to blame themselves for a variety of incidents that happen in their lives for years to come. 